without further ado, let's get right into the program. I'm going to invite Jules to join us. Jules is the executive director and co-chair of the Future of Privacy Forum. This is a Washington, D.C.-based think tank that seeks to advance responsible data practices. He works with over 120 leading organizations around the country, has an advisory board that really helps him look at public policy as well as academic perspectives. He's a former AOL America Online Chief Privacy Officer and Senior VP for Consumer Advocacy. He's also been a Chief Privacy Officer and Special Counsel at DoubleClick, and he served as the Chief Counsel Law Enforcement for New York City. Please join me in welcoming our keynote, Jules Polonetsky. Well, thank you. It's delightful to be with you. I have not been in Minnesota before, and so to get a feel for the, the people and the school and the culture has been exciting. So as the dean has started learning the culture of the, the, the college and the school, um, I'm a New Yorker. So let me share how something from my culture uh, has influenced my outlook and my framing of ethics and consumer relationships and, uh, and big data. Um, one of our uh, panelists and one of my advisory board members, Bill McGivern, who's here, and I both worked for a, a, a New York now senator uh, named Chuck Schumer, and he was sort of a, a classic New Yorker. Um, and later on, uh, when I was the Consumer Affairs Commissioner for New York City, um, I learned that it was really hard to deal with businesses um, across different cultures and different uh, neighborhoods, different languages. Um, uh, a Pakistani bodega owner, a Korean Asian fruit market, a Russian immigrant, you know, a long time uh, a New Yorker from an Italian background. Everybody was doing business in a way they thought was appropriate. And when we did a consumer enforcement and we said to these folks, you violated section 253 of our consumer protection code, which means that you've done this and that sort of fraud, it was looked at as a fine, it was looked at as certainly not a moral or an ethical lesson. Uh, and I had people who didn't understand even. They, they were confused. Like, what, what did I do wrong? This is the way I did business in my country. This is the way in, my in this neighborhood. This is what we do in our industry. And I learned that the way I could convey to them that there was uh, something wrong, um, uh, something more than you violated a section of the law, was to use what to me was a New York phrase. And this New York phrase was, Mr., what you did was chutzpah. People know what chutzpah is? I don't know. Is it middle America? We're in Minnesota. I don't know the culture here. So I'll give you the standard Jewish definition of chutzpah. A guy kills both his parents. He gets arrested. He's taken before the judge. And he says, your honor, your honor, have mercy on me. I'm an orphan. Right? <laughs> so I was in Japan a number of years ago uh, speaking to an audience. And it was being translated. And uh, I figured I'll tell them this joke. It was about internet advertising and all the the difficult issues, people didn't like it, they felt they were being tracked and so forth. And I said, listen, uh, chutzpah is a good idea. I said, but I know you don't know here in Japan what the word chutzpah means, and I give them this definition. And the audience is deathly silent. And I figured, okay, he's translating, they're gonna get it, one, two, three, and nobody reacts. In fact, people look a little bit annoyed. Afterwards, when the formalities were over, my hosts come over to me and say, um, in a very polite way, uh, you know, Mr. Polonetsky, your story about the man who killed his parents, you know, in Japan, we worship our ancestors. And I realized that my little joke was sort of akin to, you know, joking about uh, uh, child abuse or, or something that, you know, you don't joke about in any way because it's so offensive. So I'm glad that, that here we're starting on a, on a good playing field. So what is big data? Okay, so <laughs> what is big data? Um, so I am big data. Um, because as I got dressed this morning, I realized that I'm wearing my Fitbit, which is broadcasting a, it's got Bluetooth, it syncs with my phone, so it's broadcasting a unique identifier. And I have a Pebble smartwatch, and so it's broadcasting, because it syncs with my phone, it's broadcasting a unique identifier. And then my phone has both Wi-Fi turned on and Bluetooth, so it's broadcasting uh, two identifiers. So as I stand here, I'm sending into the air um, detected by Wi-Fi networks, detected by devices that are used in many retail stores to count how many people in the room or airports to know how long the wait time is. I'm walking around broadcasting four unique numbers that will go with me wherever I am and be recorded and tracked. So 
big data, which for lots of people is, I've got a big database. Um, big data is also every single one of us and the incredible detailed trails that we leave behind that are used and incorporated as big data. Now, um, when I first started hearing about big data, because I don't know, we deal with privacy in, in my world, and that means companies have data about you, the government has data about you. It's always been pretty big. I mean, the government's always had big databases, big companies always had big databases. So when did big data become big data? I mean, was this a marketing term that, you know, somebody selling some sort of better database that can better manage data, uh, you know, came up with? Some people think that that's uh, what it is. Um, the data scientists of the world uh, tell me that what makes big data something more than just a lot of data uh, are these three V's of volume, velocity, and variety. Just so much data in such an exponential way uh, that all sorts of new insights and new capabilities um, are there. So maybe it's big databases, maybe it's all the social media that's out there about us, uh, maybe it's this internet of things where uh, everything is talking to everything and our, uh, everything is possibly trackable. We held a, a conference a couple of years ago uh, and we said, who would be an interesting big data speaker? So it was right after the Obama election. Uh, and so they were known, right, the Obama campaign people, for using big data to do a better job at predicting and using databases and figuring out where to advertise and who to work. So we invited their chief data scientist to talk to us, our legal community and our policy community, about big data. And he sat there and he listened to a lot of the presentations until it was time to give his keynote. And he got up and he said, you know, I've never heard people talk about big data so much. He says, there was no time in my career when what I was doing, which was always testing, seeing what worked, doing a little more of what worked, figuring out, doing some analytics, and then optimizing to try to get whatever the result was. And that's what we did at the campaign. We got lots of data, we sent out emails, we did this, we did that, we collected it, we tested it, and we did a little more of what worked until we optimized uh, our spending and our resources and reached the people that we figured out were most useful to reach. Um, and at no point in my career did I become a big data scientist. So from a policy point of view, I guess the question is, is there something different now than what I worried about many years ago when I was worried about enforcing consumer protection laws if companies did the wrong thing, or in my earlier days when I was the chief privacy officer at a company called DoubleClick, which is part of Google, which tracks and targets ads. When did this become different from a policy point of view? Is it just a, a nice way for all of us who do privacy to kind of say, hey, it's more important now, it's big data, so we do big privacy, so pay attention? Here's what I'd like to argue. I'd like to argue that big data is bad data that claims that it's being used for such good purposes that it can trump privacy constraints. What do I mean by that? So those of you who pay attention to sort of privacy law know that globally there are a number of concepts known as fair information practices. And these have become the source of law in countries that have general privacy law. Uh, fair information practices actually began as a government funded study in the US that led to much of the law that says here's what the government can and can't do with data and has been incorporated into some of the places where we have privacy law in banking and health and so forth. Um, but these notions give people notice, give them informed consent, specify the purpose of data collection, um, limit the uses, data minimization. Data minimization? How do you have data minimization if your goal is big data? How do I tell a business person who's been told that data science, if he collects everything he can about his environment, every business uh, touch point, every consumer touch point, every email, everything that calls, that there'll be some great new insights that will help him learn how to invent a new product, do better research. What, what do I do when I say to him, well, let me talk to you about globally accepted privacy principles, data minimization, only take what you need. There's some stress right there between that concept and what we'd like to see there. Almost by definition, big data means a lot of data. It means data that can be messy but yet there's such scale that we can tease out uh, insights and patterns. Now some of the critics don't buy this. Some of the folks in the privacy advocacy community say, you know what happens when you look at that data? You start seeing these correlations and then you start thinking they mean something. Now maybe that doesn't matter if you're marketing um, and people buy more blueberries on cold days 
fine, you don't need to know why, all you need to know is go ahead, have a special on that product on that day. But in the rest of the world where we might not let you onto an airplane, we might make a decision about a product, those correlations can lead to all kinds of terrible mistakes, uh, discrimination, um, uh, wrong outcomes. Um, it was part of a, a set of essays sort of competing on some ideas around big data recently, um, and the case that we all had to discuss was the case of the curly fries. You know the curly fries? So it turns out that the data scientists have shown that if on Facebook you've liked curly fries, you are more likely to have friends that are, are smart and that have done well and that are high achievers. Liking curly fries correlates very, very strongly with being intelligent and successful. This is the, the data shows. And so it's obviously absurd, right? And so the critics say, you see, that's the stupid stuff that happens with this big data uh, where data can actually be harmful and confusing. And I said, well, wait a second. I don't think that curly fries have anything to do with intelligence. I don't know. I assume this is not a good area for you know, serious research. But in many other areas where we find a correlation that may not make sense, we may indeed discover, and that's the point of smart research scientists, somebody comes up with a theory and we learn that here's how viruses really work and here's how they spread and guess what, it's got nothing to do with whatever voodoo you thought, it's got to do with this unexpected notion. And the correlations can end up being really interesting sources of causation. The critics aren't yet convinced. Purpose specification and use limitation. So key point of privacy uh, principles, uh, you tell someone when you collect the data exactly what you're going to do with it and you don't do more than what you've promised. If there's a promise of big data, it's later on things I didn't even think about are now feasible. Look what I can do by repurposing this data in this interesting manner. Um, Google used to have a, uh, an info service where you called and it gave you your, your results. Who knew that years later that would help them with voice recognition? They weren't looking to build um, uh, you know, the Siri type voice recognition products that exist today, but they had lots and lots of people's voices saying, no, Frank's Pizza Place, not Frank's, you know, da da da. That's not what I heard, and saying it over and over and over until the machine kind of got it right. And wow, really interesting. And case after case, we've got these secondary uses. Well, I can't do that. I've got to go back and get new permission. What happens if we study healthcare data and five years down the line, we learn that, well, look at this, look at this interesting, th how do I go back and get permission for something that I didn't anticipate? The person's not here. They may not even be alive anymore or certainly interested in talking to me uh, uh, many years later. And so, again, we've got these stresses, one after another after another. Notice, um, uh, how do we, I, I, I got, on my Wi-Fi scale, I have a Wii Things scale. Uh, and when I get on it, it sends the weight to my uh, app and to my computer, and then it shows this little graph and this little chart. And it's kind of smart. Came over to the other day, and there was like a notice there. And it turns out that my 10-year-old daughter, while I was traveling, had jumped on it. And she weighs about 60 pounds, and I guess with the jump, maybe she was, you know, 70 pounds. It knew that I am not suddenly a 70 pounder. Um, and it said, hey, would you like to create a new profile for a, you know, a second user? I don't ever remember being told that the scale, which I thought was a scale, and oh, cool, instead of writing down my weight on a little scrap of paper, um, you know, hey, it was gonna record it, that's all I cared about. But the fact that it was actually smart enough to say, hmm, the mass of this person, Jules, is not now suddenly there. So some interesting use of my data, kind of useful, but nobody told me about it. They sort of assumed that this was a useful thing to do. How do you give notice if you're walking down the street? I, I like the fact that the airports are paying attention to how long that wait time is. Actually, now that I've got TSA pre-check, I don't worry too much. But for lots of us who you know, spent lots of time waiting on those lines, I'm pleased that somebody is doing something to count the number of phones online. I don't know if there's a notice. I probably wouldn't notice the notice if there was a notice. And I don't know what I would understand if when I walked by, I saw that notice. And let me ask about permission. If, if only the people who, because permission 
notice and choice and permission, these are key parts. Um, if somebody had asked permission, I don't know what I had said or done. Um, what would you have done if sometime in the last couple of years somebody knocked on your door and said, hi, I'm from Google. We're going to be driving vehicles through your neighborhood and frankly throughout every neighborhood in the world. And our vehicles, as they record the uh, front uh, you know, images of the house, we're also going to record the number of your Wi-Fi network, the MAC address of your router. Um, do you know what that is? We're going to be recording that and we're building a global database. And do you know what we're going to do with it? Every time you turn on your phone, your phone, in addition to looking for satellites and so forth, your phone is going to look and see the local Wi-Fi routers and it's going to know exactly where you are. Won't you be happy? Can we now record this information emanating out of your house by one of our vehicles that's going to record it and detect it, right? You'd be, happy Halloween, or you'd be like, call the police. What are you talking about? I'm not going to be part of that. But yet they did that, right? And Microsoft did it, and Skyhook did it, a couple of co other companies did it. And by the way, did you know you've agreed every time you turn on your phone, when you set up your phone, if you've got a smartphone, if you've got an Android or an Apple, you click through some screen that said, by the way, no need to roll those trucks through the neighborhood anymore. My phone, as it looks for Wi-Fi to get on, is going to send that information so that you can supplement that database and keep, keep it really good up to date. No, you didn't think about it, you didn't ask, you would have said no, you'd have called the place. But you're really happy that when you turn on your phone and you're using your mapping thing, do you remember how it used to put you like, uh, you know, across the street and you were like really annoyed, like wah, 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 or you had to wait, remember you had to wait like two minutes sometimes, you got in your car and then you had to wait while the thing like found the satellite or something, you're like, whoa, what's going on, whoa, what is it, a cloudy day, where's my GPS, right? Now you turn it on and it knows like you're like in your driveway and it knows it because it's looking at those Wi-Fi routers. But none of us would have ever, none of us, most of us, wouldn't have taken two minutes to think about it, to sit down, and by the way, no one's sitting down. I'm popping like a little notice. Here, click through this, click through this. You know what, even when it's good for you. All right, let me ask for some confessions here because you look like a, an honest uh, uh, audience. Um, you're at your computer. You're using Mozilla, right? Mozilla is the not-for-profit Firefox browser, right? It's not owned by Microsoft like IE is. It's not owned by Google. The fuzzy, friendly, not-for-profit people, so we can trust them, right? and your browser crashes, closes all of a sudden. You're doing something, it closes, and you get a little pop-up, and it says, can we send some non-personal information, blah, blah, blah. What do you do? Do you say yes, or do you say no? Who says yes? Go ahead, Firefox, collect my data, right? Small number, right? So Firefox tells me that's about 3%. 3% of people, I think we were more generous, maybe, again, the, the culture here, very generous, very open. So I think we had more than 3% of people sharing this. Most people are like, eh, whatever, whatever, right? And I asked them, why not? They're like, I don't know. I said, it's anonymous. It's, a, you know, you, I said, I, just get out of my way. I don't know anything about it, right? But I'm like, don't you want the browser to be better? Like, well, nothing happens right away. Well, that's true. They will learn something, and then everybody will benefit. But you know what? Whatever, right? And so people don't get, companies don't get good analytics. And this is one of the big debates, right? I've given you data for the main purpose to kind of work. Do I have the right to go ahead and analyze that data? The privacy critic, the European regulator, will say, no, get informed consent before you use it for some secondary way, right? So when, is the, when am I able to assume, because it's good for you, what, good for me, good for the company, when can I assume that it's okay to use the data that I've collected from you? Let me take another example. Um, I hope policy advice or my comments about privacy are well received. Don't listen to anything that I say about business or investing. A very close friend of mine was being recruited to be the chief privacy officer many years ago at thefacebook.com. And I'm like, don't go there, it's all college kids. There's like no money to be made in that. <laughs> He's an owner of the Sacramento Kings today, um, sports team. Um, well, he went and um, I remember talking to him years ago about the Facebook news feed. I see we have some younger students in the room. So in the old days, you went to Facebook and you saw your face, you saw your profile, and you had to go visit your friends and you would go comment on their page and they'd come comment on your page. And then of course, Facebook made a big change and people hated it. The big change was the news feed. You went to Facebook and if you had posted, I broke up with my girlfriend, instead of it just being there for your friends to see, boom, it was distributed to everybody and everything everybody did was distributed to you. And so all of a sudden this page, which was kind of boring, it was your profile page, 
all of a sudden, Facebook was this busy thing, and people hated it. I was like, no, you can't do that. That's got to be opt-in. So, well, well, but the business people are telling us that you know, this information was already available to people's friends. We didn't make private information public. That should get a change. We've just moved it around. We've made it easier for you to see stuff that was there for you, but it was there and there and there, and now we're putting it in front. I'm like, yeah, but that's different. It's busier. It's, it's, it's an invasion. Facebook, I think, had about 10 million users at the time. A million joined groups saying, we hate this. Facebook, stop it. You've turned us all into stalkers. And then what happened? Ooh, look at that. Look how she went on vacation. Oh, he broke up with his girlfriend. Look at his lunch, right? We got mesmerized. <laughs> Whatever it is that's drawing us in there, right? Whatever it is, it changed the entire dynamic and became a huge driver. And whether that sort of viral kind of thing has been responsible for revolutions in the Middle East or just families staying in touch or you know whatever the kinds of problems or benefits that it's changed, it clearly was a major driver. And I, as a business-friendly sort of privacy person, business practical, was like, I don't know. I don't know about that. We should be against that. And you, regulators hated it and policymakers, and the users hated it, but then they liked it. So when is it okay for me to assume something, even when it's new and disruptive and a little bit different, but then there have been times where people have been frustrated and pushed back, right? The, the famous Google Beacon and Facebook Buzz. I mean, there's example after example where companies have done stuff that they thought was cool and new and where people said, oh, wait a second, that's horrible, that's disgusting, that's intrusive, you better go back, right? How do we have that sort of room for, um, for new things? Um, many privacy academics, when they talk about big data, they talk about databases of rune that are being created. They talk about the new kinds of discrimination that can be enabled by databases making decisions about you, denying you benefits. Um, they talk about the power imbalance, right? The company or the government knows way more about you um, and can out-negotiate you and, and maybe overcharge you or make decisions to show you what they think is good for you. So how do we deal with these very, very different views, right? The companies of the world, the innovators, the researchers who see these great opportunities um, these great benefits for money, for research, for income, for, for you name the different societal value, uh, better health care, better environmental decisions. And then how do we deal with the fact that there clearly is this downside that if misused or abused is there? So in almost every conversation uh, I have with policymakers, the immediate thing they go to is, well, my data is going to be sold to data brokers. And then Data brokers are going to sell it to everyone else. And all this information that you thought was private, what you did at a particular company, what you did in, in, in uh, uh, one particular environment, is going to be out there and sold and traded um, uh, and uh, used in a whole plethora of challenging ways. Um, another issue that comes up right away is, OK, maybe you won't do illegal things with it, right? Because I say, okay, well, let's make it, let's try maybe to, to rein in, you know, some of these sales issues. They say, yeah, but there's still creepy things that, that we can't put our finger on um, that seem to be troubling. How do we deal with telling companies or telling government not to do things that are creepy? And I use creepy in a, in a, in a loving uh, way um, <laughs> because some of the most exciting um, things that have happened in the world have sometimes initially been jarring or creepy. When the Kodak camera was first you know, invented, you used to have to go and sit in a studio and you took a portrait. And when portable cameras were available, there was a big pushback. You could take someone's picture in the street and, and who knows what you could do with it. Trade it and put it in the newspaper. You know, there were efforts to ban uh, Kodakers from public parks. Almost like kind of the hysteria you see when you hear people talking about Google Glass. You know, oh, who's going to be recording me? You had that same reaction and then we got used to it, and yes, we still have people doing creepy things with cameras, taking pictures off skirts, doing all kinds of inappropriate uh, things. Um, but we caught up, and we have some social norms, and we have some laws in some places where there are, are abuses. But you could have seen policymakers jumping in to say, oh no, you can't take a camera into a public place, or no cameras that are portable are allowed. They must all be you know, stationary because of the privacy risk, which is what you see sometimes when we talk about reactions to new technology or to new, um, uh, to new uses of uh, data. And so when we look throughout history, we see new disruptions, and then we see eventually people catching up, policy catching up. And then sometimes we need a law because guess what? Some people aren't getting it. 
Um, we can see some harms. Let's put it in place. And then in other areas, we leave it gray and we use social norms to police it. I'm friends with some of my kids' babysitters because that's how I can easily ping them. Hey, are you available? They see that somehow before they answer a phone. Um, but if I started commenting on their pages, boy, that would oh, that'd be really creepy. Well, you're a grown up. Like, what are you doing commenting on my? You don't belong in there, right? But I have access to it. They consented. No, I understand that there are some rules. But then there's some people who it takes them longer, right? They're still typing in all capitals when they send you emails. Um, <laughs> the other day, um, I was traveling somewhere and I, I, I didn't have plans, and so I posted on my Facebook page, hey, do I have any friends in town? Maybe we can get a drink. My mother, who I'm friends with, calls me two days later and says, is there a drinking issue or something? That <laughs> I'm like, no, I wasn't. I'm not like, why are you asking people for drinks on Facebook? I'm like, OK. So you know, there's going to be a range of you know, um, speed. But businesses too, right? We can laugh at my mom. But businesses also, some of them are a little more sophisticated in terms of understanding the rules. And also, people have very different views. Many of the businesses in this room, if you've got a brand, what do you do? You probably have a service that helps monitor for mentions of your brand, right? Because you want to know, what are people saying? Are they like it? What's the sentiment? I guess that seems OK. You get a report. It says your brand's up, your brand's down. Um, no, we just want to know what influencers are saying about our brand. We want to know what our customers, here's my customer list, we want to know what our customers are saying about our brand. We want to know what our best customers are saying, so we have sort of an early warning signal that the influencers you know, in our market, okay, now I'm monitoring what you've said, a big company, I'm monitoring what you've said about me uh, in social media. Is that okay? So one interesting survey, he asked people, right? And guess what? Half of them said, yeah, if I'm pissed off at the cable company and I'm spouting about how they've mistreated me, yeah, I want them to know about it. Good, maybe they'll do something about it. I, that's why I tweeted it or blogged it or wrote about it. But the other half were like, oh, wait a second, are they going to read what I wrote? I, didn't, you know, I was just saying what I was saying. I didn't actually want someone to come up and you know, reach out to me and say, can I solve your problem? Whoa, wait, uh, that's intrusive. Companies like, you said it in public. Well, guess what? We kind of used to be a little bit anonymous in public, right? You walk out of your house, your neighbors know who you are. You walk a little further, people aren't, you know, people don't know you. Um, it's not perfect, but you probably could scratch your nose or do something that you don't expect to be, you know, embarrassed about. So you had some sort of anonymity of some sort. But now, since somebody is recording the website you go to, somebody's out there recording that MAC address of, you know, the, the different data that I'm beaming off my wrists and fists and, um, and uh, and, and my tweets and my posts, I've sort of been constrained maybe by this uh, uh, big data. So how can we deal with this? Let me propose maybe a, a thought or two. Um, so some time ago, there was a big flap. Uh, it turns out that Orbitz was showing different um, pages, different home pages, to people who used Macs, Apple Macintosh computers, and PC users. It turns out, congratulations to you Mac users, you take better vacations than the rest of us. That's what the statistics show. <laughs> Sorry, you're a little wealthier, you're a little more creative, you take high-end vacations in general. And so they were sorting their audience in a way that was probably useful. They weren't ripping anybody off, all the prices were there, you could go sort it however you wanted, you could go find a cheap vacation if you were a Mac user. But the default was to show you the better vacations. And people were shocked because I didn't know, what were they doing, who are they doing? Well, who, who, who are they to decide what I want, right? People were shocked. Well, guess what? The other day, I was on Amazon, and I bought a copy of Fifty Shades of Grey. For research purposes only, I mean, how did this, <laughs> how did this become a global publishing phenomenon? I mean, it was like an e-published book, and now it's a big thing. I, I wanted to understand that. And now every time I go back to Amazon, <laughs> yeah, every other softcore porn that is available, is being, and I'm not freaked out about it, right? Because Amazon, I didn't even read their privacy policy to know what they're doing. They say it right there. Hey, what you, we're showing you what we think you like based on what you've done, based on what everyone's done, right? They've just told me they're tracking everybody all over the place 
they're tracking our most sensitive thing, our book habits, right? Do you know who the biggest privacy advocates in America are? The librarians. You know, they will stick up. They do not want the FBI knowing. You can read what do you want to learn, how to make a bomb, you want to read about communism, whatever. They will protect your right. And they fight and they push back, right? My book reading, that's as intimate as can be. My videos, my, I don't know, I buy everything on Amazon nowadays, right? The boxes are coming day after day. Um, um, uh, and so, I ought to be very careful, and they should be very careful, right, about using sensitive categories. No, they don't have to, because they've set a certain relationship, which is, we're in the business of customizing things to make money. Actually, they don't make too much money, right? They're losing money because they're giving it away all cheap and shipping it for free, but maybe when the drones start delivering it, they'll start making money. Um, but I get the deal, and I expect that. And frankly, when they get me wrong, I'm annoyed. Well, why do you have to? Don't you know I never buy that sort of thing? I bought that as a present, right? I have to take that out of there. Or my wife used my account, and, and now it's recommending something, right? I want them to get me right. And Netflix and others. But then everyone jumps and says, oh my god, Target, when Target is you know, an incredibly consumer-focused company trying to give people the kinds of coupons and offers that are statistically what they are likely to need and buy. But yet, here are the, here are the big flap, right? Because the media, at least, were surprised or didn't expect it. And so let's talk about maybe the difference between what consumers actually like or want and what sometimes the media or the policymakers react. So you all know about the Facebook experiment, right? Facebook was critiqued because it turns out they wanted to find out whether or not if you see depressing posts, it makes you more depressed. You see happy posts, does it make you happier? I don't know, does that work or not? So they worked with some academics, they did an experiment, uh, and they uh, came out with a study. And everyone got very upset because Facebook was manipulating what you were seeing and trying to depress you by showing you more depressed posts, right? Now, I didn't really understand this because I'm like, these were actual posts that were there for me. The algorithm is already trying to decide what I should see or not. In fact, a couple of months ago, I stumbled across a, a post by an old friend uh, from years ago, and it turns out she has breast cancer, and she's been posting and writing about it, but people aren't liking it, right? Like, that's not what you do when somebody has bad news, and they're probably not sharing it with all their friends. Hey, look at this, right? They're looking at it, maybe hopefully they called her, right? It didn't know, Facebook's algorithm didn't know that this was information I wanted to see. So I'm hoping somebody is sort of studying how do you make posts that are sad that probably don't get as much engagement as like the silly picture of someone's like, you know, new pet where everybody, oh, great, that's exciting. All of a sudden that becomes the most important thing in my feed because people have, you know, liked it. I'm hoping somebody is studying what's the just right, right? But here, here was this experiment on humans and what should the rules be when people experiment on humans. Now, an academic then came along and said, let's do a study here because let's find out whether it could have been possible for the smart people in this room, the chief privacy officers, the policy experts, the compliance people, to anticipate this. And so they took a look at a couple of studies, some that were reviewed by internal review boards, right? Academic institutions, federally funded research, goes through a process that we respect, inter uh, internal review boards, academic review boards. Um, and so they looked at a couple of experiments that were approved as well without user permission. One experiment, very interesting one, wanted to learn about phishing, right? Why do people click on these emails that are sort of scammy? And so they couldn't tell people, guess what? We're going to be sending you an email and trying to trick you, right? Your guard would be on there. So they sent out uh, these, uh, these uh, emails. They had approval to do so from a review board to test what, how easy is it to scam people? What do they click on? What can we learn about how to teach people not to click on these fraudulent emails that'll get you? Uh, and they asked people, here, Here's that experiment. And then they ask people, here, here's what Facebook did. People were offended by the phishing one. Well, what do you mean? It was going to fake me out like that? that, that, that what are you going to see if I'm stupid? Is, uh, you, the, the result, you know, hey, I don't like that. The Facebook experiment, people were saying, oh, I don't know. If they had heard the media reports of the Facebook one, they were outraged because they had read about all the hysteria around it, right? And so one of the challenges in this sort of frothy area where we don't really have uh, a good set of rules is how do we come up with those norms? Okay, there clearly are serious issues though, right? Many of the civil rights uh, leaders um, in the country recently have started to focus on how big data might be used for different discriminatory uh, purposes. Um, uh, let me just jump through this. Um, uh, and clearly we need to take uh, those issues 
uh, seriously and think about them in a real sober way, right? We can have people stopped uh, and, and, and frisked because uh, they look one way or another. Um, I think what we need to do clearly is understand where are these things already illegal, right? Where do we have discrimination laws on the books, credit, housing, employment, where making those decisions, whether it's big data or little data, is legally discriminatory? And then where is it simply kind of creepy, where we probably don't want to have laws, we want to have these, these norms, we want to understand how companies perhaps have some license to do things that might be creepy when it's done by one company, but really kind of cool in what I expect from another company. So how do we have brand and consumer relationships tailor that? But then what about the real neutral issues? When is it okay to just take it? When is it fine? How do we go through an analysis where we say, I've identified the risk, what's the benefit? Well, who's going to benefit? So we know risk people know how to identify risk. But how do we examine and debate benefit? I'll make more money? Well, maybe you don't invade my privacy just because you're going to make more money. You're going to improve the product for me, for all users. What's the nature of the benefit? Is it environment? Is it health? Different policymakers, different um, uh, countries might have different views as to how much weight to give. So we need to think about benefit risk analysis, not only risk analysis, but what are we doing? In an ethical society, right, we want decisions being made that can benefit society in some ways, and we weigh that. And if we didn't weigh that, well, we wouldn't have bridges, because when we build a bridge, there's a significant chance that someone's going to die, right? We wouldn't have online banking. We always um, take a look at benefit risk. All too often, when it comes to big data, we look just at the negative. Okay, so who decides? Am I coming close to time? Yes? Okay, so who decides? We'll wrap up with this. If it's the chief marketing officer who decides whether the benefit outweighs the risk, it may be that that chief marketing officer says, well, I'll make more money, we'll market more efficiently, it's good for the market when there's a lot of competition, so we win all the time, right? Um, if it's the risk-averse compliance officer, how do we come up with a concept? I don't think companies want to put together academic internal review boards, but what of that model, what could we take of that model that would help build the kind of infrastructure that some of you are part of? Does it need some sort of diversity? Um, uh, does it need outside experts? Google has been forced by a European top court decision you know, to delete information that people don't like. Uh, and so they put together an outside committee that will advise them at what is the right balance between free speech uh, and being able to publish um, uh, data. Um, Maybe policymakers want to set the tone. So that's one of the key challenges in an area where we don't yet have those ethical norms and where we have folks showing up and saying, innovation. Well, that's not going to convince anybody. What exactly, and of course it's a bit amorphous, we need to figure out who are the right people to make the right decisions in a multi-stakeholder consensus way for the right kind of company in a way that fits in to what the cultural norms in particular societies are. I'll look forward to talking uh, about some of the other little cartoons I have up there during the Q&A, but appreciate the chance to sort of put together some of these issues and um, pass back to um, our, our panel uh, for some discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jules. I'm going to invite the panel to join us, please. And I'll do some introductions as they are coming up. Um, first of all, uh, on the um, far left is uh, Bill McGevron. Bill is the Associate Professor, Vance Opperman Research Scholar at the University of Minnesota Law School. He is also an affiliated professor at the School of Journalism and Mass Communications and a visiting professor at the University College Dublin School of Law. He specializes in information law, including data privacy, intellectual property, communications, technology, and free, and free speech. He serves on the advisory board of the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, next is uh, Jay Klein. Jay is a Minneapolis-based PwC principal who has spent two decades advising executives, the last 14 of which he spent specializing in privacy risk management. For years, he led a global privacy and security program for an international travel and hospitality company, subsequently developing his own privacy consulting firm. He is a certified information privacy professional 
and he's held positions in the International Association of Privacy Professionals. His opinions have been widely sought and published in numerous publications. And, and you've already met, of course, Jules. Uh, to my left is, and your right, is uh, Toby Tanser. Toby is Vice President, Integrity and Compliance, and the Chief Compliance and Privacy Officer for Health Partners. Health Partners is the largest consumer-governed nonprofit healthcare organization in the nation. She oversees and administers Health Partners' integrity, compliance, and privacy activities, which covers 1.4 million enrollees, over 20,000 employees, 1,700 physicians, 140 clinics, and six hospitals. Um, she is also a member of the University of St. Thomas uh, Ethics and Compliance Advisory Board and is the founder and facilitator of the Minnesota Healthcare Compliance Roundtable. Please join me in welcoming our panel today. All right, Jules, thank you for opening up, open, opening up and giving us a framework, so to speak, in terms of how to think about data analytics and big data and privacy. Uh, our panelists bring different perspectives, and we're going to want to tease out some of their thoughts. Let's start by asking our panelists to just react to themes that you've heard, what resonated with you, what's troubling to you, uh, what might you have uh, different points of view. Bill, perhaps maybe you would start us out, please. Yeah, well, um, I guess one thing that um, really stands out about big data is some of the concern about the consequences downstream. And I think, Jules, your slide about discrimination uh, really, really points that out. So we've always had a little tension and ambivalence thinking about um, the ethical uh, process of making d distinctions between people. So discrimination, when used by economists, isn't always a bad, illegal thing. It's just a way of telling apart different kinds of people, right? Price discrimination is not necessarily problematic as an economist. Um, but of course, lots of discrimination is illegal. Uh, and so we've kind of worked it out on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Actuarial tables, okay. You know, race stereotyping, very bad, unlawful. Um, and I think what ha what's happening here is that big data is presenting businesses with a whole bunch more um, situations where they have a correlation that's potentially actionable. And they're not always correlations where we've figured that out yet. And we don't even have a really good theory about why some kinds of correlations are really problematic and discriminatory in the sense of illegal, and others are really useful data that help us do things like set insurance rates. Um, is it the immutability of the characteristic and the question of whether people can change it? Not always. Is it the strength of the correlation? Not always. Is it the idea of protecting certain classes of people who are identifiable in what one famous Supreme Court footnote calls a discrete and insular minority, as, for example, race or um, sexual orientation might be? Not always. So that's really, I think, part of the challenge. That's not only a privacy issue, but it, it ends up feeding back, I think, into the privacy questions very significantly. Thank you very much, Bill. Jay, what uh, struck you with, with, with respect to Jules's comments, please? Two things really uh, jumped out at me. I think we're struggling with two main questions. What is the definition of big mm -hmm. data? And what is then the ethical criterion for what separates good big data from bad big data? I think uh, Jules's description of the chief data scientist was enlightening. I think a lot of what happens in corporate America today is still what I would call little data all grown up. It's just more <laughs> of the same. It's, it's uh, more volume, more velocity, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's just a, a, a difference in degree, not in kind. And so the ethical considerations really haven't changed right. from the past. We're still using the fair information principles to evaluate whether a corporate big data uh, program is a good program. Now, what would... Uh, the criterion that Jules proposed is, is interesting, and it's, I think it's workable if, if our companies are using uh, a big data program, and we're trying to ask the question, are we doing a good thing? Is it the cost-benefit analysis? Lacking any other moral framework, this is a good starting point. Is, is, do the benefits 
outweigh the costs, a, a kind of a utilitarian ethics. And uh, the benefits of the individuals being the central reference point rather than the, the benefits of, let's say, the common good. Uh, and so uh, when we look at, uh, when we're going and asked to come in and evaluate a company's uh, a program, that's essentially what we're looking at is, is this program going to blow up in the face of the company? In, in other words, is, is it going to be acceptable? And when, we, when we've, uh, we've, we've tracked uh, big data programs gone bad, we've done a little analysis of what are the characteristics of big data programs that have flopped, that have either generated the media publicity or have been rejected by the consumers and the employees. And there were the three things that stood out as being uh, criteria or characteristics of bad big data. The first was that it was shocking, that it was just so unexpected that this uh, company would be engaging in this kind of analysis or having the, these kind of insights. Uh, the second was that uh, there was no clear good for the individuals who were, who were being surveilled or analyzed. There's certainly good for the company and the profits, but no clear benefit for the individual. And the third criteria was there was no way out for the individuals. The, there was no choice involved. So those were the three things in common uh, of, of hmm. bad big data. Hmm. Um, so that's what stood out for me. It, it connected, it resonated with my experience doing privacy assessments. All right, thank you so much. Toby, would you share with us, please? So um, I think about that risk benefit grid, the two by two grid every day, um, probably many times a day when, um, whether it's big data or little data, um, you know, there is such a big range of um, considerations when you pulled out 3J and um, I, I think that you know, when we're, we're, we think about constituents in, for example, in the healthcare realm, and we think about our patients, we think about our community, um, we think about community benefit, sometimes more than we think about individual benefit, um, because we are interested in um, public health outcomes. We're interested in taking the information that we learn from the individuals in the system and, um, and their range of experiences and saying, how can we make this better for everyone? How can we make care more affordable? How can we make care safer? How can we make community access to care um, better and more meaningful and more plentiful? And yet, um, when we are diving into all the data that we as an organization collect, the data that's the huge amounts of data publicly available through other sources, um, and put those together, um, the people who have these voracious data appetites because they're trying to do good, um, they um, aren't thinking about that risk-benefit grid. And that's something that, you know, it, wearing my hat, I'm helping people think about it through a slightly different framework. Um, that the baby benefit, you have to think b beyond the individual or beyond the community, and risk is beyond the individual or beyond the organization. Um, so it's, the, it's really that grid and how practical it is, uh, whether you know it or not. Um, it is something that is in the mind of every privacy uh, professional uh, every day. Thank you, Toby. Um, you, Bill, you talked a little bit about uh, sort of uh, the law uh, in one sense. I guess a question, but any panelists, please weigh in. Is the law out in front of data analytics and big data? Is it parallel to it? Is it behind it? And the second part of that question is going to be about principles. Uh, principles can be aspirational, but are these principles voluntary? And if so, how do you get everybody to sign up? Who wants to be first? Maybe you'd start, and I'm, uh, we'd really be curious as to what others insights others would offer, too. Yeah, so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. I, I do not have the one sentence answer, I'm afraid. As you suggested, we're gonna have more questions than answers today. Um, so I think there's an impulse to want to sort of nail this down, right? Let's get our answer 
and lawyers are particularly prone to think this way, right? To say, you know, let's have a, a codified, clear, very specific set of rules about how we're going to go about this. Um, and I might have been a little bit prone to some thinking in that direction in the past, I will confess myself. Um, so I try not to do that anymore and um, because I don't think it's either possible or desirable to nail that jello down. Uh, it's, particular, it's true of, of most sort of data-driven issues, but it's particularly true here where things are moving so quickly, uh, it's so dynamic, and also where, you know, it's some of the disorientation, the kind of uh, uh, disorientation of our values that happens during technological change that Jules is talking about, whether it's the Kodak snap camera or big data, um, in those periods it's very difficult to make those kinds of real clear rules. Um, the good news is I do think that a lot of regulators and policymakers are coming to a place where they are figuring this out. Um, and so, for example, the, in the U.S., the Federal Trade Commission, which of course is one of the real primary regulators that's focused on privacy, has been talking about big data quite a bunch, has had meetings and workshops and, and conferences, and is trying to move, nudge things towards best practices models. But I have some optimism that the way that they're doing it is a way that leaves enough room, enough air, uh, for change and development as well, while also watching out for the most serious uh, uh, infractions or the most, the great, gravest departures from kind of the range of what we might think is okay. And that seems to me like the way the law ought to operate in this space. I'll throw out one more example of perhaps the law not jumping too soon. Um, when caller ID was first rolled out, today you probably all look at this as a protective sort of thing, right? You don't answer the phone because it's, uh, you don't want to talk to the telemarketer or whatever it is. It protects your privacy, your intrusion, because otherwise you might have to pick up who could be a mother, could be a friend, and then you talk to someone you don't want to talk to, they got you on the phone, right? It's a huge privacy protection, right? When it was rolled out, the privacy advocacy community said, wait a second, you call someone now, they don't know who you are, you're going to be divulging who you are, what if you're calling a clinic? What if you're calling a, a doctor and you, you, you don't want to know who they are, right? And they said, well, this is a bad thing. Caller ID could, and today, wow, right? It's completely yeah. the opposite. And so sometimes you got to let things play out. Yeah, and one more sentence. When the telephone originally was invented, there was lots of privacy objection about the unreasonable intrusion you know, sort of uh, upper, upper, uh, uh, upper class society said, wait, a bell is going to ring and I'm expected to stand up and go respond to it, right? <laughs> That's in my, in my own home, you know, so you have, you know, a, 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 a real roller coaster of, of opinions about this. And anybody can call you? That's right. And wait, they, they discover this identification number about me and they, they, they turn it, or actually at that point tell the operator they want to talk to me, and then a bell rings and summons me. How obnoxious, right? So... You know, there's been a backlash against smart meters too, right? Now, I love to say to some of the people, what if it was the other way around? We had these things that were electronic, and I said, you know, we're taking them away. We're sending some person to walk onto your property, <laughs> and they're gonna go onto your bedroom window and read the details which are exposed to the public. You'd have Tea Party people with like guns, don't come on my property, right? But instead, we're like, whoa, smart meters, take them away, I don't want them, right? So back to this question about law, <laughs> about law and principles. So there are two ways that you can really start to shape behavior, and I think, Bill, I've heard you say that the law uh, was maybe a bit rigid, but it started to become more flexible to say, no, this is dynamic, it's ever-changing. But the flip side of that question, the way you shape behavior is by having these principles. And mm -hmm. Jules talked about a couple of those principles. How did that resonate with you? And is that a voluntary if effort? And uh, who, how do you get people to sign up for that, I guess, is the question. What's been your experience? I'm actually, uh, I'm glad that the law is taking some time to figure this out because we if we don't know what big data is or we don't even know what privacy is, there's no real consensus of what that is, how can we, uh, how can we nail this down? Um, the mission of the center is to instill good business ethical cultures within corporations. And I think that's the starting point. And so I've seen a couple of uh, privacy programs here in the Twin Cities where the privacy program has started 
not by saying it's our job to comply with the law, uh, because these are multinationals that are doing business in countries where there are no privacy laws. And so the, the corporate privacy office still wants to do the right thing by their employees and their customers and their suppliers. And so they've aligned the privacy mission with the values of the company. And so they've made it more of an ethical foundation for the privacy program. And so I think that's more of a long-term proposition to figuring out big data or whatever new thing comes along involving personal data. If it's, if it's founded in the company's values, then you'll, the company will be better able to sort out this question regardless of where the law is. Got it. You know, I, I completely agree that culture and values are very important um, when it comes to what an organization decides to do with data, how much is it going to collect, how is it going to use it, what choices are it's going to make, try, at least try to make available to others. But I also know, having worked with 22,000 individuals, um, that that uh, the um, principles um, don't always matter. Uh, and sometimes the only way we can manage the behavior is by saying, but it's the law. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in healthcare, it's, I have my issues with HIPAA and, and Minnesota, and Minnesota, for those of you who don't know, is much more stringent around health privacy than HIPAA is, and dealing with the intersection of those two is its own, its own profession. Um, but the, um, but yeah, there are, uh, we lead off every privacy-related conversation, every security-related conversation, every initiative that is going to involve a lot of data. We lead the discussion with, this is about um, making sure that the patient and the member are at the center here, that this is about as much choice as we can give, minimum necessary, all of these um, very important, um, I agree, very important conceptual things. But in the end, we have to pull out the law and say, but this is where it crosses the line, and so now we stop. And sometimes that is... Uh, really important to have, and I certainly wouldn't want to just rely on principle-based behavior when it comes to managing um, managing a behavior in an organization. Yeah. One, one of yeah, the things a good that stick I helps, yeah. tell uh, companies, uh, they say, you're, you're in Washington, tell me, is there going to be a law? Uh, what, what's the politics? Are we going to have a new law, an old law? And I say, you know, Washington's a little bit broken. Things may happen. You can watch that. It's important. But guess what? When you're doing business today, uh, and it's technology-based very often, right? A lot of these new uh, innovations are uh, based on, uh, can I do this using your mobile phone? Can I use it do using this system? Um, when there is a problem, right, the internet sort of fixes itself. And so um, Apple said, you know what? I hear people are tracking people uh, with phones in the way I described. They said, we're not sure we like that. So they broke it. They said, no, we're going to randomize that. Um, many of us are doing business on the web, on PCs, on mobile devices, on other people's storefronts. And if you become a problem, because there's a media story, even though your customers maybe have no problem with it, if you become a problem, the technology in a lot of places is going to move and break what you're doing. You start tracking too aggressively, people are gonna start using more cookie blockers. You track in a way that Google or Apple feel is stressful with their plans for the phone, boom they'll break your ability to do that. And so I say the technology moves really fast and there's been business model after business model that's sort of been, hey, you remember those games you used to play? I don't want to be all about Facebook. You remember everybody was like inviting you to play games nonstop. And then Facebook said, mm, that seems to be annoying. People don't like it. They kind of crunched back and now you, have, you, know, you can still invite people to play games, but none of us are being you know, harassed uh, in that same way anymore. So the technology is going to solve or address many of these issues long before some of the laws will. A couple of you spoke about differences globally. So talk for a few more minutes about how does one or an organization navigate when there may be different rules of engagement when it comes to data privacy as well as um, individual rights. What's been your experience, please? Very carefully. 
A lot of lawyers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I'm a lawyer, so I'll, I mean, one thing I'll say is there, uh, there's clearly plenty of differences in a European-based data protection approach compared to an American-based consumer protection approach, by and large. Mm -hmm. um, that said, um, I'm actually uh, working on some research right now looking at specific regulatory actions. What actually happens based on this complicated, specific European law and this general principles-based U.S. law? Turns out much the same thing happens, right? Because they're, they're ultimately all pointing back towards the same kind of fair information practice principles that Jules put up on the screen. And they're doing them in somewhat different modes, but they're substantively going a lot of the same places. That is, though, I think one of the reasons why companies fall back on adopting company law, saying this is how we're going to operate. We're going to establish our own best practices, and they're going to be practices that are going to comply globally with wherever we need, and we're not going to be, you know, we'll, we'll be careful about complying with all the rules in all the different jurisdictions, but mostly we're, we're, we're doing our, our baseline. Maybe one more question, then we'd like to open it up to the audience for questions that you might have, and that's this notion of the employer-employee relationship. Uh, are there certain uh, privacy and data gathering principles or rules that should apply in this case? Uh, what are your thoughts? The employee relationship is one of those areas where, uh, you know, I mentioned those three areas where you can go wrong with big data. The employee often doesn't have an out, doesn't have a way to opt mm -hmm. out. If the employer is doing monitoring that's shocking or is not really in their benefit. And uh, I remember one example of a, of a, um, a project we were invited in to evaluate. The company had a... Uh, they had a bold idea they're going to measure the productivity of their employees and they had this new technology that was going to scan all of the activity going on in their email system who is setting meetings with whom who is texting during meetings they wanted to find out who in the organization yeah. were the real movers and shakers and they're going to assign some index to the people who are having the most meetings with the most people the, you know, across the different silos in their company. And they were just going to do this and, and make this evaluation. Well, we looked at it, it failed on all three uh, uh, criteria. It was shocking. Uh, people wouldn't expect their employer was going to do this. It wasn't clearly in the benefit of the employees, and they had no way out. So they adjusted the lens on, on all three of those criteria. They first announced it as a program, they invited people to opt in for it. And um, I, I think they gave s at least some, some publicity awareness to the groups that did the best in terms of the, mm -hmm. their, their connectivity across the organization. One of the real challenging issues is obviously around uh, employee fitness, right? Where there's obviously a great incentive to help improve, especially if you're self-insured or just to improve the, you know, the public. Um, but exactly when do you cross the line from um, hey, we'll give you a free Fitbit, um, but we want some aggregate information, don't worry, uh, to if you don't wear one, there's a penalty. Um, and I think in area after area, we're seeing that, we see insurance uh, uh, companies saying, look, if we can monitor your driving habits, we'll give you a discount. Seems pretty good, right? And it's risk-based, seems fair. Um, but what happens, well, if you don't monitor, uh, if you don't let us monitor, then you're going to pay a premium. So where we want to go in society in, in allowing those lines to be drawn right. is, I think, going to be just a challenging ethical debate. One minor thing that we should just say is um, the magic bu bullet for a lot of these things is often de-identified, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to worry about Jay's three strikes because I de-identified the data. It's all anonymous, so there's no problem. And unfortunately... That's under great assault. Now, you HIPAA folks, HIPAA's got its problems, but you can say, I did that. In everything else, we have critics who say, hmm, my three grad students can de-identify 2% of that database, so it's wrong and it's, uh, and it's risky. Um, and then we have industry who says, I have a cookie and 50 different things about you, including where you are, but oh, your name's not there, so it's anonymous, right? And so each side is looking at it, it and saying, <laughs> you know, 
wait a second, you can market to me, you can track me across my different devices, show me different ads, maintain state with me, do all these sorts of things. You can append my transactions and what I bought six months later to make sure your campaign is working. You don't have my name, but who cares if you have my name? You know me better than my mother does. Um, and then you know the critics on the other side are like, wait a second, if I de-identify the way you want, I got nothing left. I can't use the data. I want to take. I want to solve healthcare problems. I want to you know use this data. So what do you mean that one percent? And so the key place where we need to figure out how to make some progress and have some more certainty is around not perfect, but good enough de-identification. And guess what? Again, you got to get back to that benefit risk analysis. What's the risk of this being de-identified versus? hey, I want to save the world, I want to solve these problems. I think that de-identification is increasingly a myth. Um, there's so much information about all of us out there that even if we don't hit those 14 HIP identifiers, we can, we we can re-identify. I think of it more as um, sub-identification. You know, that it's, as you said, it's not, we're not going to get it perfect. We're going to try to de-identify as much as possible when we don't need those identifiers. But we know that there's going to be stuff that shows up later that we never even knew we had about you that could be used to mm -hmm. identify you or re-identify you. And we have to be really smart about, you know, make rules for ourselves about how are we going to allow ourselves to use that. Well, look at it as a spectrum, right? right. It's not black or white. It's right. the you know what, this is kind of de-identified sort of a little bit. Yeah, so guess what, you, I've can't make it, yeah, you can't make it right. public. You, can, uh, you have to have administrative and legal controls. Well, guess what, we might even give you an opt-out or we might promise not to, we're gonna put a bunch of privacy rules around it. And you know what, de facto, that ends up being the case very often in Europe where you can't actually live up to their standard for anonymous, but the regulators are, well, okay, as long as you do those things, right. we'll kind of- Good enough. Good enough. The Gallic shrug, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and good news for all the cybersecurity people in the room. Sometimes so security is a very important component of, of having pretty de-identified plus right. pretty secure is right. pretty good. If you're gonna, I mean, if you're gonna secure it, then at least only certain people can get at it right. when it's right. It reduces reduces without eliminating the risk. So if it's somewhat de-identified and pretty secure, maybe that's good enough against some threats, but not others. Right. right. Okay, we have a couple of microphones that are in the audience. We'd like to uh, invite questions from the audience. Uh, Bob, there's one right there. Got please. one up here too. Hi. Um, I guess one of my questions is: I think when we talk about big data, um, I think where a lot of the fear comes from is not the data that we as organizations may collect; it's the data that we're getting from these big data brokers, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's a lack of education to consumers about how that data is being pulled together, how they're understanding who we are, and a lot of these big data brokers, of course, are saying, well, that's proprietary, and we're not going to talk specifically about that, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, I think it's easier for us to explain how we're collecting data. I mean, like cookies years ago scared people, but I think people understand how those work now to, for the most part, but with all this other data out there that we're able to get, I think that's where I, I think a lot of consumers are really freaked out. So just wondering what your thoughts are on that. So what's, what's the role of the data broker here and others that are collecting data? You can sort of control what your organization's doing, but what about everybody else? Thoughts on that, please? Let's do Jules. Okay, well, <laughs> so I think it's hard to draw a line between a data broker uh, and um, a company that has m many, many different touch points. The big difference, of course, is that somebody's got a brand, there's a relationship, I have some control over it. Um, but at the end of the day, data brokers don't do stuff with the data. They give it to other companies who then do stuff with the data. And so, um, you know, it can be very easy. And almost every data, big data conversation uh, I, I uh, am part of, uh, immediately it goes to, Let's ban the data brokers because, well, they're the bad ones. Uh, or it's all about behavioral advertising. This is all going to be used to, you know, get online and tailor ads about you and so forth. And you know that seems a little bit too intrusive. So um, that's sort of the problem. And I think it's it's hard to draw a line. Data brokers sometimes do really good things with data. They help. Um, well, they help. Um, I want to learn whether the education system 
is working. Um, and I want to know why are women not succeeding? Why are African Americans not graduating at this rate and so forth, right? And I may have a certain data set. I know uh, how many kids, but I don't know that information. I then go ahead and I append really sensitive stuff like race, like teen pregnancy, like disciplinary. I get all kinds of data and we get these reports that say, for instance, young African American boys are being suspended at this you know, very high rate. So is it a surprise that you know, eight years later there's a big difference in graduation? But I had to go back and dig into data. And so it seems like it's, we don't like data brokers doing bad things, like selling it in some way that like, lead to aggressive marketing. But when I go through the list of the nice things that data brokers do, or you know what? Even the creepy things that are really helpful. Let me, let me name a really <laughs> creepy thing that's kind of helpful, um, since I think you have strong stomachs here for this. So you go to the doctor's office, you're pregnant, you sign up for you know, all the free parenting magazines, and you start getting all the stuff, right? Some number of births, don't, some number of pregnancies uh, don't lead to births. Companies that send you that stuff then don't want to be sending you the, hey, congratulations, here's the free package of diapers, right? So there's a list you can get, it seems horrific, a list of, you know, pregnancies that don't go to term. Someone is selling that and, and screening that, right? But it's they being didn't used. get it from us. <laughs> 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 they, they get it from, you know, who, who knows? Public records or something. And it seems mm -hmm. horrible, but they're using it to try to keep people from being marketed to in a way that would be very offensive and, and, and very yeah. harmful. So yeah. I think it's, it's just too easy to say, point the finger at the data broker, um, because there's a lot of really useful stuff they do. It seems like we want to know what what don't we want them doing? Um, wh what are they doing with the sensitive data that's good? Should they have lists of people by race? I don't know. If I'm a civil rights organization, I want to market to you know people in my category. I want to you know we've got great people in every industry in the gay lesbian marketing world in the African American who are experts in how to reach their community, right? And they want you marketing to their community. Otherwise, dollars aren't being spent. You're not trying to reach that audience. And so there are a lot of reasons that data can be used. We did a report a little while ago together with the Anti-Defamation League showing how data is very often used to fight discrimination. Guess what? If a bank has been discriminating, it, it didn't even intend to, but the algorithm is turning down Hispanic uh, you know, uh, applicants. You know what you're supposed to do? You don't lower the thing and say, well, I'll give these loans to, to people who are going to uh, fail the eligibility. You market more aggressively to Hispanic uh, applicants to get a bigger pool of eligible middle income, you know, Latino uh, applicants so that your pool's better. So there are all kinds of good reasons to use data. I say it's more about the ethics than about the, the who holds it. Ryan, Question? we've got one up here too okay. in the balcony. All right. Yes, thank you. Um, I come at this from a different perspective than probably 99% of the people in this room. I've been a prosecutor for 18 years and I talk to kids a lot. As a matter of fact, next week I'm going to talk to another school about um, internet safety and uh, data privacy issues because kids do not think about the three weeks down the road, how is this what I'm posting on Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or take your platform, how is this gonna affect me? And you know, is anybody in the conversation thinking about that perspective and how perhaps you know maybe because all of these platforms are available to minors starting legally uh, according to their terms of use at 13, um, but yet 13-year-olds don't really have the ability to foresee the risk, the cost of what they are doing. So do they get a reset at 18 and how that data is used or not used so that it doesn't affect them and carry with them for the rest of their lives for educational institutions and potential employers, et cetera, about what they are posting mm -hmm. um, and the like. This uh, very scenario has given rise to this new idea that's being advanced in the European Union. We're going to see this in legislation probably uh, in the coming year, this so-called right to be forgotten. We've already seen this implemented in a, in a case in Spain where a man wanted to hit the reset button and so that when you typed in his name, you wouldn't see the news reports about him uh, that had a negative light to it. And so this is very much uh, in play. And uh, I, it's been uh, remarkable to see how quickly the, mm -hmm. the um, web search companies have responded and built in this capability to their, their, their browsers. So I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. If somebody 
doesn't, if a child isn't informed enough to know what is actually in their best interest, that three-step criteria I talked about before starts to break down. Mm -hmm. And somebody else needs to be in the conversation to protect their interests. And so it's a good argument for the, the, you know, the so-called right to be forgotten. And, and a, a law in California that's going into effect next year, which is much more narrow than the European version, but is specifically for kids. And in, in limited, more limited circumstances, but it's called the eraser button. And it's meant to uh, offer some of the same uh, possibilities for kids to do what you're describing. It remains to be seen if it's going to work in practice, but it's definitely going to be an interesting thing to watch. I think it's hard to say to teens or kids, think about what you say or do, yeah. right? I mean, imagine we all, right? Well, no, it's not hard to say it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all say things that, you know, we don't want recorded. And, you know, look, every time you see a company in trouble, like there were emails saying, oh, my God, this is terrible. And you tell your employees, don't send emails that say we're really guilty here, right? <laughs> and, we, and we can't even get our employees to do that. Um, so I'm heartened by um, what I see as a technology trend that's less about privacy. Kids aren't using Snapchat because they don't want their messages available. They're using it because this is just like a little ephemeral thing. Why should it be around forever? Um, Jared Lanier, an uh, 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 author who's a scholar at Microsoft Research and one of the fathers of augmented reality, wrote a book called I Am Not a Gadget. Right? And he complained that we say, well, it's on the internet. It's got to be there forever, or this is the way that technology works. Why shouldn't technology be developing to reflect our norms, which is we say stupid things, and they usually go away because they're in the air. So maybe things should decay. So we have the Snapchats and the whispers. Hey, guess what? Facebook just uh, came up with this thing called Rooms. It's like the old AOL chat rooms. And you don't have to use your name, and you know they think it's going to be yeah. the next big thing. And so the technology is starting, I think, not because of privacy, because privacy is a driver, but it's not always the thing that really changes big behavior. The notion that some things should just kind of be temporary. The new iPhone has this way you can send a voice uh, text. And guess what? It doesn't stay around just because they decided why should it? It's not intended to stay around. So the default of deleting, of erasing, of now some things you want around, right? You do a blog post, you write a book, you know, you do things that are permanent. Technology should better reflect our social norms. We've got a question in the balcony, please. Thank you. I'm a skeptic by nature, so just accept that on, on its face value. <laughs> um, I, I'm concerned more about the future. I mean, I think that what you're describing today is, is, is right on point. But it seems that like our laws that we put on the books, say, five years ago for, for data security and things like that, are being used today in ways that were never envisioned when they were put in the books. And, and they're being used by overzealous people who think that they're going to make money or get a name for themselves and get elected to more offices or something. So my concern is this. As, as we think about aggregating big data with your data services and things like that, I mean, I could make the case that if you have access to big data and you can aggregate enough of it, um, if you're an insurance company, well, maybe you're buying too much liquor. So maybe we have a problem and you have a liquor problem, okay? Or, I mean, you, you can see that no matter what you purchase, you have a digital footprint someplace and and while they can't aggregate it today, that doesn't mean it won't be aggregatable in the future. And so how do we protect ourselves? And again, we've got a, a profit motive. I mean, I think about the number of times I click through accept you know, yeah. services or use of services or whatever on my iPhone or whatever the phone is, uh -huh. you know. Basically, you're giving up your life and everything just to use the applications that are free on your phone. And, and all of a sudden, it's like, well, but you gave all that stuff away knowingly. Um, so, so you see there's a tension between what's going on, what you've given up, and maybe what might be in a good place in the future. So some response. Jules, maybe this speaks to you. The name of your organization is the future of privacy. So looking into your crystal ball, <laughs> um, what key themes do you think are important for us, please? I suggest that across almost every aspect of society, insurance, health, cars, transportation, uh, you name it, your interpersonal you know, relationships, um, data and moral, legal, or ethical decisions about data are going to be uh, the most essential decisions that we're going to be debating uh, in terms of society. Um, I think the data is going to be there because there are too many places where we want it, we need it, it's useful, and we're going to need to have the right constraints in the right places that ensure 
that we are more empowered, right? I mean, why are we doing all this? Just because we can do new things with apps? The goal ought to be that we are better, healthier, more in control, have more uh, ability to you know, self-actualize or whatever the way you want to look at it is, as opposed to a world where everyone else is making better decisions about us and we're hemmed in and the signs I see tell me what some company thinks it wants me to see and the government tries to help me but you know, shapes my future and my world or puts me in a certain track. And so I think increasingly it's not going to be about the data because the data is going to be there for a whole range of purposes. It's going to be whether I'm the powerful human who now has more information and makes better decisions and has a better life and a better career and better health or is, are a lot of other people because of their own profit or their own goal of improving something going to be making decisions that leave me hemmed and narrowed and, and, and squeezed in and will it be too late before we somehow wake up one day and say we're happy and we're healthy but we're actually zombies that are you know being shaped by everything else. So when I started my career it was about how are cookies tracking you, what's the right way to do it and now I do feel that the issues that we're debating are the future of the world. Mm -hmm. Any other final comments? <laughs> um, uh, we are at our closing time. However, our panelists will be available through the social hour. So we invite you to spend some time uh, checking in with them with respect to other questions that you might have. Um, please join me in saying thank you to our panelists for just a great job. Again, I would be remiss if I didn't again thank our major program sponsors, including Travelers and PwC and Bremer Financial and the Catherine B. Anderson Fund, uh, our reception sponsor. And please join us for the reception as we adjourn is, is Financial Executives International. And thanks again to our promotional partners, FEI, NACD, Twin Cities, the Twin Cities Privacy Network, and both the Holleran Center at the University of St. Thomas Law School and the Corporate Counsel Institute at the University of Minnesota uh, Law School. Thanks to the CEBC member companies. A number of you are on hand. We're so glad that you're here. And finally, thanks to the uh, CEBC team members who helped to pull the program together. One more round of applause for everybody, and then we are adjourned. <laughs>